Nightmare and insanity are akin. Mysterious and involuntary states that skew and distort objective reality. One wakens from nightmare. From insanity, there is no awakening. Whether Americans live in the one state or the other is the paramount question of this era. For 200 years, Americans have been indoctrinated with a mythology created, imposed, and sustained by a manipulating cabal, a financial elite that built its absolute control on the muscle and blood, ignorance and credulity of its citizenry. It has now metastasized into the corporate tyranny that owns and controls America. America began with the invasion of a populated continent and the genocide of its people. Once entrenched, it embraced enslavement of another race. With those pillars of state in place, it declared itself an independent nation in a testament that proclaimed the equality of all mankind. In that monumental act of hypocrisy, America's myth had its genesis. A constitution was written that came to be regarded as holy writ. Designed by men of wealth and prominence, its central purposes were to defend private property and suppress mass democracy. It has fulfilled those mandates beyond the dreams of its creators. With the existing oligarchy secure in law and native people largely exterminated, the ruling class increased its wealth and power fantastically in the 19th century, using the government as its enabler, exploiting to the limit the device of chartered corporations. So empowered, the financial elite used the military to expand its sway beyond the continent. Regions, territories, islands, and whole countries were annexed, invaded, and possessed outright. Their peoples crushed, suppressed, and exploited. Because ordinary Americans, like any people, need to believe that whatever the ruling class undertakes in their name must be essentially benevolent, noble in purpose, and justified in fact, the American myth had to be radically modified for imperial expansion. The foundational myth was that the Americans had come to a howling wilderness teeming with godless savages, and through invincible strength of character and purity of purpose had tamed the land and honorably earned the right to possess their bountiful home. In the era of extraterritorial expansion, that version was polished to justify and ennoble imperialism. The new corollary was that America was obliged by our manifest destiny to carry our mission into barbaric darkness wherever tyranny created abuse and suffering. A national myth that absolutely binds the loyalty of a people to its government must be a subtle and powerful elixir that elevates and aggrandizes that people's self-regard. National policy will then appear to be an extension of its superior citizenry's inchoate will and an instrument of justified arrogance toward the lesser world. The simple, powerful myth of America's heroic and altruistic benevolence, shaped by the financial elite, infused Americans with a hubristic belief in their racial superiority that mobilized gave imperialist enterprises the character of a quasi-religious crusade. In this way, insatiable imperialism acquired the apparent moral perfection of a syllogism. With World War II, the world was reconfigured. American capitalism emerged supreme from the horror that had virtually wrecked its capitalist partners. The Soviet Union, though, in spite of having absorbed much the greatest devastation of all from Nazi Germany, rose astonishingly from its ruin to become the sole rival to America as a world power. This challenge was not competitive, it was systemic. Soviet communism was a direct threat to American hegemony in that it categorically refuted the philosophical basis of predatory capitalism. Grounded in Marx and Lenin, it attacked capitalism's inherent evils, monstrous inequities, and flagrant injustices that, when exacerbated by speculation, exploitation, and fraud, would eventually destroy it. And it promoted world revolution to that end. The Cold War required further refinement of the American myth. 
Instead of simply intervening where circumstances supposedly demanded that we impose our system, America now had to be the shield and bulwark of the sacred capitalist system in which free enterprise, magically identified with democracy, was equally to be defended. This version held through many surrogate confrontations in the era of mutually assured destruction, and survived even the debacle of Vietnam, lasting until the collapse of the Soviet Union. On radio and television, Americans were subjected to an unrelenting barrage of hyper-patriotism, in which American moral superiority was a given, and America's self-touted courage, generosity, and decency were its unchallengeable proofs. The implosion of the Soviet Union left America in its own terms the sole superpower in a unipolar world, which required further retooling of the myth. The practical effect of having no doomsday enemy China wouldn't do yet, was to supercharge its element of pure hubristic ego. America was no longer just the defender of the free world from heresy. It was now, by virtue of its glorious self-touted exceptionalism, required to oversee and police it in the interests and for the benefit of all. Power tends to corrupt, said Lord Acton, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. When the only rival to American power disintegrated, our ruling elite saw the opportunity for the first time in history for one country to absolutely dominate and control the world. This consensus was expressed in a policy statement by major hard right-wing political players titled The Project for a New American Century. This triumphalist manifesto laid out a plan for absolute American access to and control of essential resources and raw materials worldwide guaranteed by our military enforcing full-spectrum dominance. The American myth, which had lost some momentum in the totally unexpected so-called Cold War victory, was now re-energized with a proactive essence and endowed with the glowing radiance of a true and for the first time self-professed imperial mission. The attack on the towers, an unimaginable provocation, was the trigger mechanism for the explosive launch of the effort to impose that imperial model in practice on the world. It has been without question the most spectacular failure in the history of American misadventure. After a decade marked by the waste of trillions of dollars and thousands of American lives, the stunning bankruptcy of our internally burglarized nation, and a consequent recession more fundamentally damaging than the great one, Imperial America has nothing to show for the astonishing folly of its arrogant overreach, but unequivocal disasters in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan, with no end of madness in sight. It is clear that the hypnotic hold of the American myth on the loyalty of the people has led only to disgrace and tragedy, and set a course to inevitable imperial decline and ruin. This truth, though, entirely mistakes the purpose of the myth. It was never intended to serve either our country or our people. It was created solely to shield, buttress, and exalt the financial ruling class. It has done that with complete and astonishing success. As a prime example, the massive looting of funding for the Iraq-Afghanistan-Pakistan wars to enrich the corporate tyranny is on a unique scale of its own, without anything remotely comparable to its flagrant obscenity in the whole long history of war. Neither the Pentagon nor the government can account for the billions of dollars that have vanished there. There is no doubt that beyond the outrageously inflated no-bid contracts given to giant corporations with their obscene guaranteed profits, much of the money was simply stolen by, through, or in spite of the military, and distributed among thieves and accomplices. Much of it came in in bricks on huge pallets, for convenience, presumably. As this wholesale corporate robbery was in progress under military oversight abroad, the corporate tyranny evolved a new set of impenetrably complex devices for the generation of money 
without either any economically productive source or result at home. The sole driving force and purpose of capitalism is, of course, the realization of profit. According to that iron calculus, reducing production costs increases profit margin. This leads to the obvious conclusion that as production costs near zero, profit is maximized. There is no provision for social good in capitalist theory. Corporations, created to optimize commercial opportunity through efficient specialization, were originally required to operate for public good, but that provision was quickly finessed and forgotten. American law courts have always favored corporate concentrations of wealth since they, like the Congress, exist to serve moneyed interests. And the judiciary has consistently cooperated in ruling reliably for corporations and against the interests of the people. Indeed, without considering the question in law, the Supreme Court long ago endowed corporations with personhood, that is, with all the rights of human beings under our Constitution. That this travesty occurred as a slipshod clerical error shows that the court preferred to mask this perversion of the intent of the 14th Amendment as an unexamined assumption rather than risk an eventual test which would have created public outrage. Given the collusion of Congress and the courts in securing